Hey everybody, welcome to your video on algorithm time complexity and big O notation. We're going to go through some really common examples of algorithms and understand time complexity. So as soon as people start talking about this on YouTube or in class, they always start pulling out a bunch of numbers. And I'm not saying that's not valuable, but for a software developer, I think it's more important just to understand some common examples and to understand it more practically. So that's my goal here, mainly because I stink at math and I don't want to go into all that. So we're going to just go through some concrete examples. So where do we even start? Let's first try to understand the purpose of time complexity and how to think about it. So when we have some algorithm, basically some code that processes data, it might take a certain length of time. And we want to know which algorithms are faster. So how do we measure this? Well, you know, you might think, hey, why don't we just time it and say, this one took 10 seconds. We try some other algorithm, it took 20 seconds. Ugh, that one's slow. Well, seconds are not really a good way to measure this because for one, you could put it on a different computer and it might be faster or slower. Plus, it doesn't really talk about how the algorithm scales. It's more about as we increase the size of data that we're processing, how the algorithm speed changes. So that's the purpose of big O notation, is to not worry about a specific time to process a certain amount of data, but more a way to classify how fast it is. Another way you could think about this is, let's say you were walking and your friend was driving. So this is you. I cannot drive cars. Looks like a hat or a mustache or something. Anyways, this is someone driving. All right, and I told you guys, the first person to get 10 feet wins. So, like, very close. Now, if you were just ready to go, you could probably sprint past that point before this person had the time to turn on their car, put it in drive, and get across that point. So when you're working with this very small distance, you can see this one's actually faster in terms of time. But what if I told you, now you have to go 10 miles and the first person to get there wins. Obviously the car is going to win because that startup time is so insignificant, but it's so much faster to get that 10 miles than if you were walking. This might be a weird example, but the same concept applies to algorithms. We start off by working with a very small set of data, certain algorithms might be faster than others. But as you increase the size of data and you're no longer working with just a very small set of data, you're working with a huge set of data, you can really see what algorithms are faster. So cars are obviously faster than walking. Bicycles are somewhere in between. There are different classifications. So we're gonna take these concepts of the different classifications and apply them to algorithms. When we're dealing with the different algorithms, there's often going to be an input of the size of data we are working with. So imagine an array of numbers. This could be your input and the size here is four. But we also might want to process a different array that has four million pieces of data. So instead of just having a specific number like four, we generalize it and say n. So n represents the length of the data. So a classification of algorithms you might run into might look like this. O, and then in parentheses, you see n. So the O, this represents big O, and you can look up the mathematical meaning of that. There's also like big theta and junk like that. But the main thing you need to understand is that when we see O with something in parentheses here, we are measuring the complexity of an algorithm. So if we have big O of N, it's saying that the operation is dependent purely on the length of the data. And I'm gonna show you an example of an algorithm that is O of N, and then we can look at some variations to understand some other algorithms. All right, so we have this collection of a bunch of numbers and I want you to find the number three. Obviously, using your eyeballs, you can see it's right there. So it's really simple, but imagine this is a very large list. You're not gonna be able to use your eyeballs like that. So you're gonna tell a computer to do it. 
How is the computer going to do it? Well, it's actually just going to search through this element by element until it finds what you're looking for. So there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine elements. So n is nine. And the computer is going to look at the first number and say, is this three? No, it's not. 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 You guys get the point. And in the absolute worst case scenario, three is at the very end and it takes nine operations to find it. It basically checked every single one until we get to the ninth one and it finally finds it. So that is why this, this searching algorithm is said to be O of N. Another way to think about it is if you doubled this list, well now it's going to take twice as long because it has to search through twice as many numbers. So it's always dependent on the size. Another example, instead of a search, you might be looking for the maximum number. So you'd basically keep track of the highest number. So you'd start at the beginning. So you would just say max is data index zero. So to start off max is 10. And then each time it compares, is 24 larger? Yes, it is. So that new max is going to be 24. Is five larger? No. Is seven larger? No. Is 13 larger? No. 120? Yep, that is. So it's going to replace it. Is 35? No. 72? No. Three? No. So it basically has to go through every single element, do a comparison, and if it's larger than the max, replace the max. So that is how you would find the maximum inside of some set of data. And this algorithm is O of N. So if it helps, you can just think of O of N as the standard. It just iterates through the entire collection and finds whatever you're looking for. But there are other classifications of algorithms that are much faster and other ones that are much slower. So let's talk about some of the other classifications. So let's do a chart here. And let's say this down here is the size or in other words, n, how big the input is. And let's say this over here is the number of operations. So how would we graph O of n? Well, as the size of the list increases, it increases in operations equally. So we get a perfect line. So if n was 10, the number of operations would be 10. Some algorithms are actually much slower and they are classified as n squared algorithms. So it's gonna look something like this. And it's gonna be O of n squared. So if there's 10 elements, then there's going to be 100 operations. So that is one of the worst. What's a really good one? Well, there's another classification which is actually just constant time. And you can basically think about that as being instantaneous. So this is O of one. That's how you write it, constant time. An example of this is if you want to grab a particular element in an array, where that array is all one set of memory where everything is connected and each individual element is the same size. You can just take that size, multiply whatever index you're trying to get and you'll get that data. We're gonna get into some more constant time examples here in a minute. But for now, let's talk about some of the other classifications. There is n factorial, which if you can imagine n squared being slow, then n factorial is like so slow. So this is gonna be big O of n factorial. There's another one in here, which I'm kind of running out of room here, but that is going to be big O of two to the n. We're going to have the square root of n and then another one which is log of n. So these are the different classifications. Going back to that silly example I gave you earlier, this is walking to a different state. This is driving to a different state. Actually maybe this is driving to a different state. This is flying to a different state. <laughs> this here is teleporting to a different state. Although if you're walking with someone and someone might be a little bit faster, it doesn't even matter because you're still so dang slow compared to these ones over here. Now I wanna take a look at some constant times. So to understand this, I want you to understand a data structure known as a hash table. And here's how a hash table works. 
It allows us to store data similar to how an array would work. However, the way the order in which it's stored is different. So we basically have this thing called a hash function. And when we want to store data in this data structure, which I'll draw it over here, we don't just store the data itself, we also store a key. So I have a key and a value. So let's say we wanted to associate a user ID with a person's name. We might take ID of five, Caleb, and when we do this, that key is processed through this hash function and that is used to determine a particular spot to store this element inside of the hash table. So here's where Caleb's going to go. Internally, this might be stored at index three. It could be stored at index 200. It doesn't matter. All we need to know is that it processes through this hash function to get us that number. And we'll probably do a video dedicated to hash functions and hash tables. So don't feel like you have to understand how this works. I just want you to understand what it does and we'll get into how later. So what it does is it takes that key, converts it to some index and stores it in this structure. Well, let's say we did that with a bunch of data. So we passed more data into this hash function and it looks something like this. A bunch of key value pairs in this structure. And let's say we want to grab the person with the ID of three. So what we would do is we would index and use three, the key, to grab that data. It's gonna take that key, process it through the hash function, and immediately know where to find that data. This is an example of a constant time process. It's constant time because it goes directly to that position. If instead we had an array of these numbers, and I wanted to find three in here, I would have to search through each element to figure out if it's it. For here, since we're using that key, it just jumps to that position and automatically gets us that value, Sally. So hash tables are extremely efficient for inserting data as well as retrieving data. So that, that is a very common use for them is if you need to insert a lot of data quickly or retrieve data very quickly. Based on the key though, you're finding it based on the key. If you wanted to search and find Sally, that's not gonna be quite as easy because it doesn't have any knowledge of where Sally is because Sally was not used for the hash function. The key was used for the hash function. That's how it determines where to store it. When you're looking for Sally, you use Sally's key to find all of her information. Now I wanna go through another example of a constant time using an array. All right, so here we have an array. And now we're going to access the data using positional indexes. And you might be wondering, what is this 0, 4, 8, 12, 16? Well, consider these to be memory addresses. So at the very beginning, we start at 0. And an integer, 32 bits. So after 4 bytes, we got that next integer. And then another 4 bytes, we have that next integer. Another 4 bytes, and so forth. So let's put some data in here. We can store whatever we want in here, assuming they're integers. Doesn't matter what the numbers actually are themselves, but they have to be integers. This explains why arrays are typed. When you're working in a programming language, let's say Java as an example, you might do something like this, where you type to an integer array, and then you give it a name such as grades. So internally, the storage might look something like this. Now let's say we want to grab an element, so we pass in an index, and we'll just say this is an array called grades, so to call it, it might look like this. And let's say we grab index three. Well, it knows that the start is right here. This is the start. This is index zero. This is index one. This is index two. This is index three and this is index four. So we're trying to grab this element right here. So a constant time process that we could create to jump to this position would look like this. Four, which is the size of an integer, and you're never gonna have to do this in a programming language like Java, but this might happen internally. Um, so you could say size of int, multiply that by three, the index. What does that give us? 12. So it immediately jumps to memory location 12. 